Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Future is Happening Now, Ensuring Perioperative Sustainability. I am Brian Zimmerman with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward uh, to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Lee Hedman is the Executive Vice President of Surgical Directions. Lee's collaborative management of operating room transformations has yield, yielded significant increases in surgical growth and millions of dollars in hospital profits. Lee has successfully worked with physician practices to improve revenue cycle processes and improve financial performance while transforming the anesthesia practice to perform as a business entity and an invaluable partner with the hospital. Dr. Joshua Miller is the Physician Managing Director of Surgical Directions. Dr. Miller has demonstrated experience in medical group management, including P&L responsibility and hospital surgical and medical group consultative services. Dr. Miller has worked with practice leaders and hospital partners to integrate best practices, compliance, practice optimization, and physician satisfaction and well-being. And at this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Lee to begin today's presentation. Lee, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a great Memorial Day. Those of us that were here in Chicago, we're happy to get some heat and sunshine and, and really have a couple of days to relax without thinking too much more about COVID. Um, Dr. Miller and I will continue to narrate through this and navigate through COVID-19. And today we'll discuss three key objectives, um, how COVID-19 has changed the way operating rooms across the country function, and then how those changes will likely impact recovery. And then lastly, we'll look at how we move forward in ways that will continue to optimize patient outcomes and look at the financial viability of our hospitals and ASCs and how we can sustain that moving forward. On a personal note, I've spent the last 20 years strategically partnering with hospitals on operational efficiencies within the OR and generating top revenue for hospitals. But we now need to focus our efforts on how COVID-19 has changed the way we think about operating rooms across the country. The COVID-19 has created a financial trend in the wrong direction for not only hospitals, but ASCs and physician practices as well. Office visits have seen at least a 50% decrease or more. Patients are afraid to go for their follow-up visits. A lot of offices have shortened their hours for safety reasons. As we all know, elective surgeries have declined for more than 20, 70% at this point. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the hospitals have had to focus on COVID-19, and it's taken a lot of effort to do that and a lot of manpower. And secondly, because of the pandemic, we want to make sure that everybody is as safe as possible. So the hospitals have um, gone to not having the elective surgeries, but now today we're starting looking, putting them back on. And healthcare facilities are also dealing with a lot of additional costs due to the crisis. They've had to spend time and money educating and training staff to work in different areas. The overtime for the critical care professionals has been extreme in order to have enough coverage for the COVID-19 patients. A lot of excess staff in the procedural areas have had to be furloughed and the purchasing of additional PPE has cost the hospitals a lot of money. Back just you know two months ago, people were wondering what they were talking about when they were talking about PPE. And now it's a standard word at the dinner table for um, what is needed for the hospitals and the professionals to be um, safe. Prior to the pandemic, healthcare was trending to a much different platform than we have known. There was a shift to ASCs for convenience but now there's even more of a shift because we're trying to get the cases back on for the elective cases. And we really have to look at what cases um, are better done at the ASC versus the hospital and vice versa. And there's also becoming a greater comfort with telehealth and virtual care. 
because of a lot of uh, hospital uh, hospitals have not been able to have their clinics open or physicians' offices have had to shorten their hours, uh, the physician, physicians and patients are going to telemedicine, which there's been a lot of talk of that in the past, but not too many people have moved forward with it. And now it's becoming, even if you're an older adult, your kids are there to help you navigate through your telemedicine um, visit. And then the patient consumer, all of us can now internet shop, so to speak. We can look at what facilities we wanna have our, our procedures done at. We can also look at the backgrounds and the outcomes of different surgeons versus just talking to the neighbors. So with the internet, a lot of people have become a lot more savvy and are able to shop around for where they want to have their care versus just going to the hospital near their house. And then of course, patient safety protocols, including stricter use of the equipment and the cleaning and everything has really um, been amplified. And then we continue to look at value-based care and how we get great quality outcomes and look at our costs. As perioperative consultants, we believe that some surgical processes will change for the good. PAT visits, for instance, we've been talking for probably the past five or six years and trying to get more of the visits done over the phone where the nurses will call the patients and go through what's needed for their pre-admission before their surgical procedure. But now we're looking at different ways that the majority of the visits can be done online, so to speak, like that, with at least filling out your forms, talking to a professional, a uh, healthcare professional, and getting a lot of that done before you come to the hospital. There may be fewer elective surgeries, and Dr. Miller will talk more about that, but patients may really look for more of a conservative treatment for some of their problems, such as pain management. In today's world, we're also going to need to look at the definitions of urgent and emergent cases. And depending on where the hospital is and the type of cases they have, those may take on a new definition, at least temporarily. And then our elective cases may be moved from the hospital OR to the ASC to help reduce costs and to really increase patient and surgeon satisfaction. Hospitals really need to work today to make the patients feel comfortable and communicate with them, which we'll talk a lot about today, so that they feel like they are safe when they come to the hospital. So some of the changes to workflows we've looked at over the last two months to optimize surgical services may become, like I said, permanent in the OR. For scheduling and access, we're really looking at the different cases and how many minutes they generally take but we need to look at the backlog cases and see which cases should take priority. And then we're looking at longer turnover times. Best practice is generally 20 to 25 minutes, but in today's world, we're looking at more of 50 minutes because we really have to look at how the rooms are cleaned in between cases and also how the airflows are changed. We talked a little bit about PAT and data service testing, but today we also have to add on the COVID-19 patient and staff testing and then also look at that PAT visit and make sure that we have everything that we need. As we go through and look at the procedures, we need to really look at the risk mitigation, especially for orthopedic or orthopedic cases, ENT, labor and delivery. And then Dr. Miller will talk more about the anesthesia techniques and how some of that has changed. As we look to our clinical outcomes, we need to really focus on communication. At this time, we can't over-communicate to the patients and their families. Most of the hospitals, you cannot even have a family member come in with you. So we really need to make them feel comfortable and feel safe. As we talked a little bit with my background and Dr. Miller's, we've always looked at revenue cycle management. But from the OR perspective, that's really been the front office or the back office that has looked at that. And in today's world, we really need to be conscious of when we board a case to come into the OR, we need to make sure that we work with the front end to, to have the insurance verified, especially in today's world where so many cases um, may not have in, in the insurance anymore. There's been so many furloughs, so many layoffs, and people have lost their jobs. So we really need to be careful 
to get them pre-certified and to make sure that they have the adequate insurance coverage. And then we need to look at all of the data and analytics to make sure that we're managing our OR on an effective basis, both for the caseloads as well as the cost. Additionally, hospitals and ASCs need to communicate with their families and with the patients. We need to have those updated safety protocols with the insurance authorization, like I just mentioned. And then the day of surgery protocols, your hospitals by now should have an idea of where the patients are gonna come in and where they're gonna be dropped off. And then also the waiting room policy. If they do allow one family member or friend to come with them, they need to wear masks, they need to have social distancing, and the hospital needs to make some of those arrangements. And then also the testing protocols. I said we need to make sure that we have all of that done beforehand as much as possible. And we need to communicate with the patients um, social distancing is one part of it, but we also need to look at 14 days post-procedure and if there are any COVID-19 symptoms to continually be communicating with the patient to find out if they're feeling okay. So how will those changes likely impact recovery? I'd like to turn the conversation over to Josh Miller as he discusses the clinical aspects of the reality of COVID-19 and the current situation. Josh? Thank you, Lee, and thank you everyone for being on for this call. So Lee has done a really nice job of laying out the state of procedural care right now. So let's talk about what recovery may look like. I think first, and I think we all understand this now, the concept of a smooth linear recovery doesn't appear accurate and it's not playing out in healthcare facilities across the country. We initially hoped for a V-shaped uh, 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 situation where we had a precipitous drop in procedures followed by a dramatic and ra rapid recovery, or even at the worst, a swoosh type recovery where we had a precipitous drop and then a gradual and inclined recovery. Um, but uh, this may not occur as a point to be tied to economic recovery. Um, the good news is in Wall Street article this past Monday suggests that some of the cyclicals are starting to return. We're starting to see some return of airplane travel. Hotels are starting to be booked again. So we are starting to see some recovery, but healthcare is gonna look different. And that's uh, going to be tied to different areas of the country where COVID is having a greater effect or less effect based on population density, um, local, state, or city regulations. Um, you know, For example, North Carolina phase two allows breweries to open, but not bars. They're very uh, idiosyncratic rules uh, based on location, and that is affecting how healthcare is coming back and procedural based healthcare is coming back. Testing and contact tracing is going to be key and remains a challenge for us. For example, in Wuhan, uh, the province tested 9 million people in the past seven days. This past Friday alone, Wuhan province tested 1.5 million people. So that's for context, that's three times more people on one day than is tested in the United States. Uh, and this was done to prevent a recurrent second wave. They use a batch testing where 10 tests are pooled together and then you have an all 10 are negative, or if it's positive, those individuals are then tested individually. Uh, they've also been aggressively performing serology, which is antibody testing. The bad news on that, again, using Wuhan Zogan Hospital, which was the epicenter hospital, the serology testing of all of their employees found only 2.4% of employees and about 2 to 3% of recent patients and other visitors, including people being tested before returning to work, had developed antibodies. So again, in context, 2.4% um, for the employees in the hospital had converted to seropositive. For herd immunity, we require a minimum of 50%. Now that's bad news, but the good news is that in both humans and primate studies, there appears solid evidence for immunity. In this past month's Science Magazine, a study from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston found that uh, in SARS-2 COVID infection protects against rechallenge in rhesus monkeys. So what it's all this is saying is that the end game will most likely be a vaccine and it looks to arrive in late 2020 or early 2021. The testing is also uh, variable in our country. So we don't do enough testing and we also don't necessarily do it 
uh, in a uniform fashion. Castlight performed a county by county analysis on May 20th. In that analysis, 54% of all U.S. counties have no testing facility, none at all. And recognize that many counties are not population dense and that may not uh, increase or impact the risk of spread with secondary localized epidemics because of the lack of density. So what else is going to affect uh, recovery of procedural-based care? Uh, healthcare workers are exhausted. Um, New York uh, has just wear and tear on both the facilities and the people taking care of us in the hospitals. New York has started to ramp back up, and they have about a 30% ramp up of elective procedures, um, but the staff is still exhausted in managing the afterglow, if you will, of the pandemic in New York City. Arkansas, on the other hand, is almost completely back to scheduling all elective procedures, and they had minimal effect from COVID initially. There are billions of dollars in postponed revenue. The, the lost revenue is just that, it's lost. And that's the little red arrow to the right. But there is postponed revenue that we hope to recover. The most efficient facilities are now focused on how to maximize the recovery of that postponed revenue. Not all procedures are in the OR, and Lee touched on it briefly. There's a significant amount of what we call elective NORA procedures or non-operating room anesthesia procedures that we would like to capture as well. A quick word on NORA. NORA is highly variable. They tend to be high volume procedures and a very short duration. Some examples would be interventional radiology procedures, procedures done in the cath lab, endoscopy, interventional pain procedures. And as I said, they're variable. Some are cleaner than others. They require specialty and procedure specific guidelines. For example, a pain block requires little, a little bit of local anesthesia on the skin and is basically a transcutaneous procedure versus an upper endoscopy procedure, which generally requires a general anesthetic and intubation. And then there's a lot of aerosolization in, during an upper endoscopy. Um, and so this will uh, really require the engagement of the proceduralist, and we're gonna talk about that in just a bit. All lost revenue will not be recovered, as I said. While hospitals and ASCs and providers lost 50% or seven, uh, between 50 and 70% of revenue, the CARES Act only replaced between two and 4% of that revenue. 30 plus million people lost their jobs and the job recovery looks to be uneven with some economists suggesting up to three to four years to recover our previously robust economy. So what does that translate to for our patients? That means lost benefits, that means the ability to afford copay, and that for the ones that are still employed may mean that they can't take time off to help with a significant other's procedure and post-procedure care. They may now be the sole breadwinner, they're in a competitive work environment, and they don't have the, the luxury or comfort to be taking that time. Surgeons' offices were closed for four to 12 weeks. So that pipeline that is usually continually flowing to the operating rooms was lost for between a month and three months, depending on the, uh, the uh, physician's office. And urgent and emergent cases may have been done at another facility, as, as Lee was talking about. The, the, the push to the ASCs out of the hospitals has only been exaggerated by what's been going on uh, with COVID. So what does that mean for the hospital? And this graphic uh, sums it up nicely. There's about an average of 700 uh, cases per operating room in a busy OR suite, and that's per year. The average US hospital has on average 11 operating rooms. We've had an estimated postponement of between 50 and 70%, so we'll round it to 60%. Um, and the average contribution margin per case in the United States is a little over $4,000. Um, and then divide that by four weeks. And so the average sized hospital lost between 1.3 to 1.9 million in operating income. That's operating income, that's not revenue per month. And ORs um, across the country lost between 7.8 and 11.6 billion throughout the country for per month. Uh, the Kaufman Hall flash report uh, suggests that the mean hospital revenue is down approximately 282% from April 2019 to April 2020. The mean hospital margin in April 2020 was minus 29%. 
So already the normal skinny three to four percent margins of a, a hospital are now underwater across the country. Uh, so it's a lot to think about. Uh, and I'm sorry. There we go. The nature of healthcare may and most likely change. Large global events tend to change culture and the direction of humankind in general, and we're seeing it happening now. Healthcare has largely been a transactional business. About 65% of hospital revenue is driven by procedural care. This is probably not sustainable going forward. For the forward thinking hospitals and healthcare systems, this can be an opportunity. Think about population health, partnerships with physicians, mature clinically integrated networks and ACO models, disease bundles rather than procedure bundles. Think about high deductible health plans causing patients to act as true consumers and shop for care. It's a little bit again of what Lee was talking about. This will be consumer driven really for the first time. Procedures will move even more rapidly to specialty ASCs. They're highly efficient and focused on delivery of procedures. Hospitals in particular will need to up their game. In the short term, they'll need to make patients and staff feel COVID safe. Patients are not comfortable coming to the hospital. It was in years gone by and even months gone by, it was a place where a patient felt that they would receive care and be safe. During COVID, emergency department visits are down between 40 and 70% for cardiac and stroke care. Patients' hospital elective chemotherapy is down up to 27%. Now, this is elective chemotherapy for cancer care, and the results are staggering. People are not coming in for their chemotherapy. There's a clear secondary care concern, which I call death at home, for patients who need hospital care but fear COVID more than they fear getting treatment in the emergency department for their acute myocardial infarction. So what does this speak to? Again, there will be aggressive move towards telehealth, and particularly in the anesthesia and surgery environment, telehealth pre-anesthesia testing. There will be vigorous testing of patients and staff uh, for pre-anesthesia, pre-surgery, uh, for the elective uh, surgical procedures. Again, aggressive use of PPE. I'm pretty sure nobody thought about putting on a mask uh, to come into a hospital six months ago. Um, it will be the standard going forward until we have really resolved the COVID issue with uh, vaccinations. The schedule for the operating room will become even more surgeon and patient centric. So that means there will be more weekend elective evening elective schedules, particularly for those employed patients and caregivers. There will be more assistance with financial issues associated with loss of employment, including insurance issues and copay issues. So financial counseling will become even more of the forefront for our patients moving forward. The hospitals will need to manage costs, and that's not news to hospitals and hospital administrators, but it's really critical in the current environment. So Moody's uh, just recently uh, suggested that it will require between 130 million to 1 billion cumulative dollar reduction in cost through 2024 to maintain a 4% margin. And obviously that's dependent on the size of the hospital. So the hospitals are gonna need to even more manage fixed costs such as employment and personnel. Consider things such as using loaner trays in the operating room versus uh, acquiring purchasing trays and having them sit uh, in their uh, sterile processing and move through sterile processing, less fixed costs. More about uh, full-time equivalents versus 1099 employees. Are we going to hire uh, full-time equivalent nurses, respiratory therapists, or is it going to move to more of a 1099 model? Every aspect of administrative costs. Examine every aspect of the cost structure. In the longer term, hospitals, will they be everything to everyone? Will hospitals move to specialty disease care? Will demand even recover for care? And will it be more disease management and more of what I call outpatient management uh, of disease processes? The bottom line key is for hospitals and ASCs to strengthen the relationship with both 
surgeons, and patients. And those are really the strategic partners for the hospitals now. Um, it's not really going to be the insurance carriers going forward because it's the, the, both the surgeons, if they're not employed, and the patients will have opportunity to become consumers. So what does that mean? The hospitals will need to be sophisticated and prioritize the uh, current elective surgical backlog that we've built up from the COVID pent-up demand. And they'll need to utilize specialty specific data analytics and uh, a subcommittee of engaged and supportive surgeons to help define how to correct the current backlog. Include, as Lee talked about, COVID-related delays in surgery schedule, uh, enhanced terminal cleaning. So terminal cleaning is generally the cleaning that's performed at the end of the day in the operating room. Think about it like an airplane. The airplanes uh, in years gone by were sort of cleaned between flights, but the, at the end of the day, they had a formal cleaning. And that's essentially what happened in the operating room. That's no longer going to be adequate. Terminal cleaning will occur between each case. Also need to think about air circulation after anesthesiology intubation. So I think many have read about the number of people that have been intubated for COVID. That requires uh, a, uh, a direct laryngoscopy where we actually look at the vocal cords uh, uh, with a special instrument and put a tube in. It tends to be coughing, aerosolization, and the air in the operating room uh, is going to need to clear. It does clear fairly rapidly, but we're going to have a period of waiting before we start surgery to protect the employees in the hospital. We have to be careful about donning and doffing of operating room PPE. We're going to be much more involved in day of surgery checklists, including COVID checklists, patients collected at the front door, for example, directed to pre-anesthesia suite uh, by one person in days gone by. Patients and their family would walk in the front door of the hospital and say, I'm here for my surgery. They'd be all escorted up to a pre-anesthesia area with a bunch of other people. Those days are gone as well. Um, there will be a post-anesthesia care nurse that will take care of the patient one-on-one -on -one and most likely escort that patient back to the patient's family's car uh, after the PACU stay. There will need to be a defined follow-up plan for patients and hospitals and surgeons will need to market those checks, checklists for safer surgery. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. So we've talked about the current state and the expected short-term solutions. Now let's talk a little bit about hospital ASC and healthcare systems roadmaps to sustainability. The concept of the checklist is more important now than ever. We've discussed some ideas around the checklist in the immediate COVID world, but to sustain a formal and detailed operational checklist will be essential. It really starts with the surgeon and the patient deciding that surgery is the appropriate next step. The surgeon's office will be the lead in scheduling by communicating the elective procedure to the facility. The rules need to be very clear. Generally, by 72 hours before surgery, if not completed for elective surgery, the case will be delayed or canceled. And so what does that mean, the rules? The that starts with the surgeon's office, as we discussed. So order sets, pre-anesthesia sets, consents, history and physical all need to be done by 72 hours. Financial sign-offs need to be approved. So the financial team at the hospital needs to get pre-certification for the facility and potentially for uh, the surgeon, depending on that relationship. Pre-anesthesia testing with appropriate labs needs to be completed. Physical therapy, home health, vendors, for example, if a joint replacement is to be performed, the appropriate joint vendor with the appropriate joints and sterile process trays need to be available and signed off. If it's an early recovery after surgery protocol, which is a specific protocol for mobilizing patients rapidly through the surgery process, all those protocols need to be in place, including prehabilitation, appropriate protein-based drinks, pre-surgery, et cetera. And then this all needs to be communicated with the patient and expectations for the patient, the family, and the operating team need to be communicated. It's a collaborative effort, but there needs to be defined goals defined roles, ambiguity leads to finger pointing and frustration by the surgeons, the staff, the anesthesiologists, hospital administration, et cetera. I spoke briefly about the COVID Recovery Committee earlier. 
The Committee for COVID and ultimately post-COVID should include many stakeholders, the medical staff, including the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, internists, specialists, to coordinate the medical care, which is why we're all here, operations, administration, and nursing. So we need to understand, can we do these elective procedures? Do we have the appropriate number of ICU beds laid available? How many ventilators do we have? What's our PPE status look like? And that's the operations of the hospital team. The IT team for smooth transition of patient data and financial components of the uh, patient data. And of course, the finance and accounting team at the front end rather than at the back end to assure elective procedures are booked and set with insurance and the patient ready with copays. There will be a rush of post-COVID cases, so prepare now. As discussed, engage your stakeholders in a COVID Recovery Governance Council. Include all of your stakeholders, the surgeons as leaders of the committee, the hospital administration, perioperative nursing leadership. Prioritize the schedule. And how do you prioritize? Well, case urgency, physician volume, payer support, and the return on investment, which is a bit of an elephant in the room, but it needs to be discussed. Reach out to the patients, and as I said earlier, talk about your facility's COVID safety. Educate your staff as to the safety plans in place for them. So this is now the staff, because you have to have your staff feel safe as well. So that's testing, the PPE, minimal family contacts in the hospital, et cetera. So you have to market not only to your patients in your surgical uh, referrals, but you also have to uh, market to your internal staff that's going to be in there doing the work every day. So to be effective, the COVID Council, as I'll call it, will need a complex data and have the ability to parse the data with knowledgeable data analytics team. And a hospital may or may not have the sophistication to build scheduling models based on that data. What we do is we take historical data from the past two years, if available, backlog case data, so our COVID backlog data, and current surgeon block assignments. And so block assignments uh, are basically agreed to time slots for surgeons based on their historical volume. And those should be in place for efficient operating rooms currently. We then input into a forecasting tool built by Surgical Directions to determine forecast analytics by surgeon, by the practices, by the hospital or ASC capacity, and the utilization, and then iterate that with the council, including return on investment, acuity, equipment or staff constraints, and backlog volume. The council is physician-led with operational members of the system, administration, nursing, leaders, financial, et cetera, and operates with full transparency. From this work, new COVID surgery blocks are created until the backlog is resolved. The mechanism can then be used to redesign block with a formal surgical services executive committee. It really becomes a physician-directed operations team for OR scheduling. Many aspects of this committee can ultimately be transferred to the formal and permanent surgical services executive committee. The committee will be involved in all aspects of the surgical experience, from the surgical check checklist I spoke about earlier, to block scheduling, quality assurance, equipment supplies, et cetera. So, uh, in short, this disaster, really disaster for U.S. healthcare and for our culture and economy, is an opportunity to transition and to develop resilience and flexibility in the healthcare system. Lee's going to discuss the transitions in more detail. Lee? Thank you. A lot of great information. So, where do we go from here? Hospitals that adapt to the changes from COVID will be the ones that will survive and prosper. We need to change our perspective. Change is very difficult, but we cannot do business as usual. In many respects, the OR isn't any different than other businesses, such as a hair salon that is working right now to make changes with their floor space to make, make sure that they have the social distancing needed, or the small family-owned restaurant that was faced to only have carry-out or curbside service. Everybody's had to think out of the box. And so healthcare has to evolve with the trends. Medicine has moved to a more of an outpatient setting. We come in the day of surgery versus the day before, and the majority of time we leave within hours of the procedure. So we have to adapt and plan for the immediate future. Some of the things that come out of where we are now with COVID, we will need to or we will adopt and plan to keep moving those forward. As we leap forward, proceduralists will be needed to maintain and grow the surgical volume, and we should embrace that. 
So the recovery addresses patient and, and staff safety first. So currently we're in the first zero to six months. So we're looking pre-vaccine, the short term on how we can create that safe environment for the patients and their families. The road back won't be easy and it will not be business as usual. We'll need to accomplish a lot of things in a short period of time. And then within the six to 12 month range, we'll start to understand more about the changes in insurance, the financial situation for millions of the unemployed, and we'll really start to work and see what we can do to be able to do those procedures for the patients and to make sure that their health care is up to date. I mean, when you watch um, the news and, and Josh touched on it, so many patients are holding off on their chemotherapy because they're in fear of coming to the hospital or they're holding off on thinking they have chest pain but not taking that step they normally would have to get in the car and get to the hospital or to call an ambulance. So we have to make them feel more comfortable and safe. And then 12 months, we're hoping about, you know, we're, there's a lot of work out there. A lot of money has been poured into getting a vaccine, but also then to, the, to balance the new surgical demand and the reality. So we'll be looking at staffing, like Josh mentioned, will it be the same as what it is today or was? Probably not. We'll need to look at the equipment that is needed and then also look at the OR and how it functions. I mean, as we talked earlier, the OR generates 60 to 65% of the hospital's revenue. So it's very important um, for us to refocus on how we're going to bring those, that case volume back into the hospital and make people and surgeons as well feel comfortable and come to our facility for care. So some of the first steps that we think that you can make to take from this, uh, this webinar, and, and thanks again for joining us, is to make sure that you take time with your team. Incentivize your team and make them feel needed and appreciated, whether it's the pizza in the afternoon so they don't have to try to get lunch or miss lunch or a Starbucks or whatever it is. Um, I know that a lot of places are bringing in things for the healthcare workers, but we don't want that to drop off. We want to continue to appreciate everything that all of the healthcare workers are doing. As Josh touched on, we need to really look at our governance. Whether it's for COVID or thereafter, we really need to build that multidisciplinary collaborative leadership model. And by that we need to, what we mean is to really bring in um, administration, surgeons from different specialties, your anesthesia chair, and also your nursing directors, and really have them sit and discuss what goes on in the OR and look at what is going on today, what their needs are in the future, and to really plan and address those challenges that may be out there as well. And then we need to manage the capacity. We need to look at the financial viability, and some of that is the different procedures and looking at the insurance verification, the pre-surgical authorization, and make sure that we also have the right cases at the right place. Many hospitals now own an ASC or, or multiple ASCs, and we really need to make sure through those different um, procedures what is best to be done at the ASC versus the hospital and make sure that we're getting the most incentive of, of uh, cash flow that we can. And then also to align with the continuum of care and manage our costs per specialist basis. And really at that governance, you can, usually, you can look at all your different costs. And when you put it down in black and white and manage by analytics and by data, it's a lot stronger than just talking about it. So Surgical Directions is here to help. Um, we are consultants, but we also look at the different things that you may need that we can do even remotely at this point to help you. And obviously, you know, we all know that um, the sign of a good leader is knowing when you need help. And let's face it, a lot of people need help. A lot of places need help at this point. And we like to partner as part of our consulting and really help to either help you, guide you through some of the different transitions you're taking and change transformation. Or if there's a void in leadership, we can help with that. And central sterile processing, there's a lot of issues throughout the country 
in those departments where we can really help migrate some of those problems for you or mitigate some of those problems for you. And then as many of the things we talked about today, we look at the digital part of it. We are living in a digital society and we need to look at data and analytics. And we've really come up with a lot of different programs that we can write and go through your particular system, whether it's Cerner, or Epic or others, and really work to deliver that um, on a timely basis that your governance committee can then use to really figure out where you're going within surgical services. We have experienced consultants that work with us, and they're all either anesthesiologists, surgeons, nurses that have been directors in their prior careers, um, data analysts that have just graduated their master's program in analytics, and then also the strategists that really look at, or the strategists that really look at where you are and where you want to be and how we fill that gap and move you forward. We do a lot of our work through peer-to-peer, -peer, so our physicians work with physicians, et cetera, to make them feel more comfortable and talk the same language and look at the results that we're all looking to get and gain. And again, um, a lot of analytics as we come to the conclusion of this. So we'd like to thank you for your participation today and, and listening to our thoughts. Our company has done a lot of work in the last two and a half months helping to um, look at what COVID is doing to the healthcare environment and really help put some things out there for you. So we have a lot of tools we're willing to share. And if you just give us a call or shoot us an email after this, we'd be certainly happy to do that. Thank you. And I'll turn this back over to Brian. Thank you so much, Lee and Dr. Miller for that great presentation. A lot of a lot of helpful information for our attendees in there today. So, and we will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard, and we'll get through as many as we can. And we've had a lot of great engagement today, and we really appreciate it. Uh, and as I mentioned, we will get through as many of these uh, questions as we can. The first one I'm going to take here is, uh, with increased use of ASCs, do you anticipate a long-term effect on the current model of physicians being hospital employees. Uh, so feel free to weigh in there, Lee or Dr. Miller. Josh, I think that'd be something that you, with peer-to-peer, -peer, you'd be able to talk more about the physicians. Sure, sure. So, I, you know, it's interesting. There's really, um, it's bifurcated. Um, <clears throat> and it depends on um, the specialty. Uh, and it also depends on where we're going to go with population health. So uh, it's, a, it's a relatively complex question. I would suggest that many proceduralists, uh, such as orthopedic surgeons, um, as an example, will have currently ASCs, and they're interested in, in further moving their patients to uh, physician-owned ASCs if possible. The hospitals are, uh, are, in general, interested appropriately in the employment model, because then it's easier for them to manage a clinically integrated network. Um, I was involved in a 2,600 member um, clinically integrated network um, and, uh, and actually was the treasurer of the clinically integrated network and saw the, how complex it is to appropriately incentivize non-employed physicians in a large multi-hospital healthcare system. So the short answer is, depending on where you're sitting, uh, there will be movement towards ASCs um, if you're a, 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 a group of proceduralist type physicians um, who want to own their ASCs, but recognize that as we move more into disease management and population management, that may be a short-term look, but down the road, I think we're going to be looking more towards disease bundles and, and payments based on disease and not based on procedure bundles. A complex and kind of mixed answer there. Yeah, thank you for tackling that one. Uh, certainly a complicated situation that, you know, will evolve over time. Um, the next question we'll take here is, the attendee asks, should ASC staff be tested for antibodies? And if so, how often? Right. Um, so. Again, this is a complex question. Um, first of all, um, it gives, uh, it, it, from a marketing perspective, it, you know, it would be a message that I would give to all of my patients to uh, let them know that part of what we're doing to make it a safe environment is we are testing 
all of our employees on a regular basis, weekly or whatever. Um, the reality is, of course, uh, there's no guarantee that serology testing, antibody testing is reliable. Uh, we've seen there's about 60 different uh, serology tests out there on the market, um, and some of them are not that great um, with an up to 10% false negative rate, um, and um, th there's a lot of ra variability there. And the biggest risk is you know, going out and having a false positive. Um, and that means that I'm, uh, you know, a nurse working in the operating room. I'm, my serology is positive, but it's a false positive. So I assume I've been exposed. I haven't been exposed, and then I have COVID. Uh, so again, uh, it's, some of it is, there is some level of comfort to give that message to your patients. Uh, there's also some level of comfort that you're doing everything you can, you know, state of the art, end of May 2020, that we're testing everybody but recognize there's false positives and false negatives. Thank you, yeah, no, no easy answers here. Um, so the next question I have then is, the attendee asks, is it acceptable to have patients notify our ASC if after 14 days they develop signs and symptoms of COVID-19, or should we contact each patient? I believe the attendee is asking, should we contact each patient to, to check in there? Um, I guess it's a clinical question again. I'll, I'll take, try to yeah. give a stab. I think I, th I think it's reasonable to you know in part of the as part of the post op uh, call to see you know how was your experience et cetera et cetera to ask have you had any signs or symptoms. Um, I think it's important that we understand you know three decades as an anesthesiologist we use what are called universal precautions so we assume everybody is going to infect us with something terrible. Um, so uh, that's how you uh, approach every single patient, and it's to protect the uh, the staff in the operating rooms and in the hospitals. I think you still do that. Um, the the issue is is um, contact tracing. So that's what we're doing in in the operating rooms. But is everybody in the ASC at that level of risk uh, aversion and risk protection? So if you do have a patient that has signs and symptoms, it helps as far as contact tracing to see who they may have uh, come in contact with, uh, whether it's uh, you know somebody that escorted them into the ASC or the, the person at the front desk that's checking them in. Um, it just helps to have that contact tracing information. And right now, this country is not as good at contact tracing as we need to be, um, and we'll get there. Um, but if you look at other uh, sophisticated countries that are really having a decrease in um, in uh, new disease, new epidemics within the pandemic, what they're doing is aggressive testing and aggressive contact tracing. So that's where I would use it. And so I would ask that question. Great. Thank you for that. And the next question the attendee asks, will terminal cleaning between cases persist over the long term? Will this be a long-term trend we see after after the pandemic ends, or is it just a short-term protocol until the close of the pandemic? That's a great question, which um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we look at is uh, risk of infection, perioperative risk of infection, and what is an acceptable perioperative risk of infection. Um, in general, uh, the Risk, perioperative risk of infection is low with standard cleaning, um, and but the difference now is um, uh, that we have aerosolized droplets everywhere and we're potentially exposing uh, patients to a highly infectious uh, disease process, which is different than in normal times. So, uh, you know, um, and I can't really read the tea leaves, but I would not be surprised if in five years, uh, you know, or two years after people are all vaccinated and we come kind of go back to what I would call no, more normal times, the terminal cleaning may decrease because, um, you know, it's just, it's, it, it affects efficiency and throughput and probably doesn't in normal times decrease risk of infection. Thank you so much for tackling that one as well. Um, the next question we have here is, what are the future protocols regarding vendors that are not required to be in the OR? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. question Josh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, though. 
Gotcha. Uh, may, maybe this is perhaps something we can we can table and reach out to uh, the attendee directly later after we've had some some time to mull it over. Uh, I want to keep the momentum going though for the Q and A uh, since we had so many great questions come in. So the next question I have here is the attendee asks, can you discuss the evolution this will bring to the physical OR environment? Well, sure. Uh, so the ORs are changing dramatically. I mean, the ORs that I started in in the late 80s uh, look nothing like the ORs do now. And so we have things such as, you know, hybrid rooms. We have uh, MRI or CT scanners uh, in the operating rooms now. Um, we have the, the, the state of art for the anesthesia equipment. Anesthesia equipment now looks nothing like it did 20 years ago. Um, there will be more opportunity to do more things in the operating room um, that we just couldn't do. Um, and so it will continue to evolve. Uh, you know, we are creatures of growth and uh, new and innovative ideas. Um, from, you know, endoscopic surgery is another example, robot surgery. None of that existed. And those will only become more sophisticated. So if you were to look at the operating room from the 1950s to the 1980s and then look at the operating room from the 1980s to now and then look 30 years forward, um, it's almost hard to imagine what things will look like uh, except to know that there are really brilliant people in the fields of science and medicine that are coming up with new and innovative ways to help all of us. Um, and that will only continue to grow. So I'm actually uh, very uh, bullish and, and optimistic that the operating rooms will continue to change. There will be more artificial intelligence, uh, both on the anesthesia side and on the surgical side. Um, there, there will be more robotic-based surgery. Um, it will become more precise. The imaging will get better in the operating room. Um, so, you know, an example, uh, if I was doing a trauma in the, you know, 1990s, patient would have uh, a surgery and then they'd get rushed down to an MRI scanner and then we'd find something else and get rushed back up to the operating room. Now in hybrid rooms, that doesn't necessarily need to happen. All that can be done in one place, much safer for the patient and better outcomes. So bullish. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have time for a few more questions. So the next one we'll take is, what are some of your change recommendations for OB departments? As far as COVID, or is that? Yeah, well, I, I believe. Wanna, I believe. Uh, so I think, um, well, I, I think again, a lot of it will be checklist based, um, and uh, you know, family members will not be in the in the labor delivery recovery room. Um, COVID testing will be important. Serology testing can be done as well, um, and again, ser serology and COVID. Uh, microbiology testing, which is testing for the viral particles, um, has a false positive and a false negative rate. So you still have to assume the patient uh, is potentially at some risk to uh, the um, the people working in the labor delivery recovery room. The COVID checklist, um, you know, how people are brought in. Um, the good news is uh, you can do uh, rapid COVID testing. Um, you certainly, if you have a woman who is going to have a scheduled C-section, um, you can get all that testing done beforehand. Um, the there is, um, if you can avoid surgery if you're COVID positive, you're better off. There was a study in I believe it was the April 2020 issue of the Lancet, which is a British medical journal, looking at uh, COVID positivity and ICU admission. And um, for similar patients uh, who were both COVID positive and COVID negative, the uh, rate of ICU admission for COVID negative patients for a set of procedures was, I believe, around 26%, which is sort of the expected, if you will. But uh, in COVID positive patients, the expected, the, the uh, rate of admission was about 44%. What that suggests, and it's it's not really rocket science, is that when you have an, a, a viral disease, your immune system is being attacked, and surgery stresses your immune system. So uh, you are at increased risk of complications if you're COVID positive. So in general, you think about trying to avoid um, uh, surgeries in COVID positivity, and that's what a lot of what we've been talking about today is about, well, if you're COVID positive, is it, and it's elective, 
uh, is that the direction we're going to head in? No, we're probably not. If it's a cesarean section and there's discussions around, and I'm not an obstetrician, let me let me clearly make that uh, that statement. But if there's options around, um, can we have a trial of labor versus uh, go immediately to a cesarean section? So, uh, what's called a VBAC. Um, uh, are we are, are we going to go that route if somebody's COVID positive? It may alter the obstetrician's decision making, um, and and so again, a, a lot of data points that go into medicine. It's not pure science. There's a lot of art to it, um, which I'll defer to the obstetricians. But again, a COVID check, checklist, much like we talked about for surgery, is very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, for tackling all these uh, clinical focused questions. The next question we'll take is the attendee asks, what can medical device and or medical technology vendors do to better support ASCs and or hospitals during the COVID-19 transition? Lee, do you want that or you want me to take that? Uh, no, go ahead. I think that's more medically driven. <laughs> so I, I think, um, you know, um, my experience with vendors is um, so a little bit of my background. I'm also fellowship trained in interventional pain medicine and did a lot of implantable spinal stimulators and implantable pumps and all that. The best vendors that I worked with um, um, anticipated what my needs were going to be. Uh, they had the equipment there, uh, so I was never delayed. Um, they they uh, were very good at. Um, providing me information with the newest uh, Medtronic device or Boston Scientific or whatever particular piece of equipment I was using. Um, they were very good at getting me the information, um, uh, educational information. Uh, here's what, how this works and why this is different. Um, so uh, science-based, you know, being chatty and a nice guy or gal is great, but really I think most physicians want to know about the equipment and have that equipment ready to go in their armamentarium uh, uh, in the ASC, so they don't have to wait for a specific uh, hip or knee to come from across town. Uh, nothing aggravates the surgeon more than that. Thank you so much, and we're, we're approaching the top of the hour here, so this will be our last question, and then I'll lead Dr. Miller if you have any final shot, thoughts uh, to share with attendees. I think this would be a great time for that to tap those on as well. The last question here is, can you give us some examples of how to incentivize staff when so many have been furloughed and the remaining staff are expected to pick up the workload? Well, it, it is very difficult. It's very difficult times. But again, something as simple as, you know, having lunch provided for them or having some breaks that you can factor in. Um, also, with the furloughed staff, I mean, just communication, because obviously when people have lost their jobs within a, a group that always works together, it's very difficult because even the people that are still there are feeling almost guilty because some of their friends or coworkers have, have been furloughed. So I think you can't over-communicate, but some of the things that always work are, you know, food. You, most places anymore, you cannot give um, money or bonuses. I mean, there may be some, um, if, if you talk to administration, there may be some ways that you can do that due to COVID, but generally that has not been, um, you know, gone over very well to be able to give additional money. So it's really giving them some time. Maybe if you do have a slower afternoon or something, letting them go with pay because um, that's important right now, and just trying to make them feel more comfortable in any way that you can. Thank you for tackling that one, Lee. And that is all the time we have for today. I wanna to thank Lee and Dr. Miller for their excellent presentation and surgical directions for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it.